Hey, folks. Today's program brought to you by probably my favorite uh, sponsor. I don't like to choose. <laughs> I don't like to choose between them, but this is definitely one of my favorite sponsors. SunsetLakeSebaDay.com. Uh, use the code left is best. You get 20% off. I don't think there is, though, I will say this, a product I use in more different ways on a daily basis. In more different forms. In more different forms than sunsetlakesabaday.com. I use the tincture. It helps me get to sleep. I use the tincture sometimes during the day when it helps me deal with my children. I give as a gift uh, the fudge. That has some Sabade in it. On the weekends, I have a coffee with Sabade in it. That's my weekend brew. But I'll also use the gummies to get some sleep uh, with the melatonin and the full spectrum ones with a little bit of taste, if you will, <laughs> in the Sabade gummies. Um, I will also, uh, 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 after maybe a nice meal, mostly on the weekends, I'll have a uh, maybe a pre-roll of the Sebe Day. And, of course, uh, Matt loves to use the keef and the flour, mix it in with his other recreational uh, things. Check out the smalls. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all the pro Oh, and, of course, the solve I use for uh, mosquito bites on my kid and uh, for my occasional eczema. Hmm. Sunset Lake Sebe Day, great company. They uh, have... Donated thousands upon thousands of dollars to uh, really great uh, causes ranging from strike funds to uh, food pantries, refugee re resettlement. They do great business practices, $20 minimum wage. Uh, they also m majority owned company. Uh, I mean, a employee, a majority employee owned company. They have great uh, farming practices. Regenerative practices, they work with the University of Vermont to protect the sto soil, but they also use integrated pest management, so there's no pesticides on their product. Uh, just an all-around great product. SunsetLakeSebaDay.com. Coupon code left is best. Longtime fans of the show, you get 20% off. And I will also say this, they're doing something special for Election Day. So stay tuned for that. Mm. Gonna need some Sebe. Oh yeah, I think uh, that we're gonna we're gonna be leaning heavily on that. In the meantime, let's start the show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is Casual Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday. Tuesday, Casual Tuesday. Wednesday, Casual Hump Day. Thursday, Casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, Casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, November 4th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the proprietor of the Uber blog, Hullabaloo. Digby will be here. Or perhaps you know her as Heather Parton, writer at Salon.com. Also on the program today... Four days out from an incredibly expensive, in fact, record-breaking expensive, and frankly, determinative midterm election. Also on the program today, Lonnie Musk starts his assault on his <laughs> own company. Right now, thousands of Twitter employees are opening up their emails to find out if they got fired. Anticipate uh, some problems on that app today, folks. And despite the Fed chair's best efforts, U.S. jobs numbers surge. Donald Trump floating a November 14th presidential run announcement. New results from Marist poll. Fetterman leading Oz. Meanwhile, also garners Oprah's endorsement. That same Marist poll... Warnock 
the slight edge over Herschel Walker. At least in terms of numbers. Large edge in just about every other factor. Not running between the tackles. Exactly. <laughs> Mark Kelly, slightly over Masters. In Israel, Lapid concedes, welcoming in Netanyahu and the most right-wing government in Israel's history. China Xi calls for no nukes in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Study finds that San Francisco cops quiet quitted to sink Chesa Boudin's prosecutorial tenor. Huh. tenure. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Surprise, surprise. Right now we're all shocked. Protect and serve. And asterisk. Throw a fit. Truce announced between Ethiopian and Tigrayan forces in a uh, war that has killed maybe hundreds of thousands of people. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is, uh, like I said earlier, four days out from the midterm elections, yet it is still casual Friday around here as evidenced by my soft collared shirt and the fact that Emma does, you don't know, you don't even wear a collar. Yeah, honestly. well, you can't see, but I'm wearing leggings today, right? I try to leave that for the weekend. Is no that cares. is that casual? No I one don't, cares. Yeah, I, don't I mean, they're, I've been told by my mother, not appropriate uh, for for more formal settings, but I don't really care around no, here. No one, no one cares. No one cares. I don't know about that. It's I mean, comfortable. I mean, I wear sweatpants every day, so... I understand. I, 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 <laughs> Matt is. Matt, Matt's committed to it. Matt's committed to the uh, every day is uh, casual. It's like, uh, it's, yeah, there's a lot of casual stuff. I mean, going Bradley's on. Bradley's now. Uh, I followed suit. Fall, 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 For about three months, I wore jeans. You want your producers comfortable. Yeah, no, I get it. Uh, there's no, uh, we don't have anything, no buttons in this office. Uh, we should wear a tie. We should wear a suit and tie just randomly one day. <laughs> <laughs> That would be really funny to show up in a tuxedo. <laughs> when Matt came in for his job interview, I got news for you. <laughs> he he had a he was wearing yeah, like a gray suit, a suit with it, a three piece suit. Is that real? Yes. No way. The three piece implies the vest, right? You did have a vest on. No, I. That is, in fact, I don't even know what you else came you had into on. This office in a suit. I don't know if and I had a vest. vest on. You it, definitely had a vest on. <laughs> or was it the old office? No, it was it this, been this one. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, he had a vest on. That that uh, that's the that. There's two things I remember from that day. <laughs> one, uh, you said that you had read about 153 books the year that year. Um, unemployed post college with yes. with uh, <laughs> gotcha. like you know from an audio recordings and the whole mechanism they in that you were also wearing a vest and i was like bingo that's it that's the tooth check and check yep. all my boxes checked so <laughs> there you go matt also had a cane and one of those jimmy door hats <laughs> <laughs> a monocle no, no. no he was very uh, he was very earnest he was very dapper uh, in that uh, that suit all right. He's British for a while. All right, folks, let's start. Let's get into this. Um, I'm not going to lie. I was hesitant as to whether we should play this clip at the top of the show because it's really a, a rude awakening. But um, Donald Trump has really, uh, I guess, uh, made a big attempt and a successful one to lay about as low as he can over the past two or three months uh, so that his presence doesn't hurt the Republican ticket, nationally speaking. Of course, he goes into places and has supported uh, specific candidates, uh, but there has not been, the Democrats have struggled a little bit to nationalize this election. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that with Digby in a moment. But uh, here is Donald Trump. This was him in Sioux City, Iowa, last night. On the eve of reports this morning that came from both Newsmax and then subsequently the New York Times and I think the Post. Uh, and Axios as well. And Axios that Trump is looking to announce his presidential run on November 14th, which is also the day where he is slated to give testimony. Is that right? Yes. Well, uh, I mean, at least the documents are due by today, 
he's supposed to provide them to the January 6th committee. They could stall, but I think there's a reason he picked November 14th. I mean, how insane would it be if he announces the day of and then throws that testimony into chaos? Yeah, they requested he testify under oath on or about November 14th. So there you go. That's his, his testifying. But this is what he had to say last night in Sioux City, Iowa. And now, in order to make our country successful and safe and glorious, I will very, very, very probably do it again, okay? Very, very, very probably. Very, very, very probably. Hmm. There's new green compass. Oh, that's nice. Well, get ready. That's all I'm telling you. Very soon. Get ready. Get very ready. Very, very, very probably. The font on the hat just keeps getting bigger, right? Yeah, I've noticed that too. The green ones are uh, uh, make our farmers great again hats. Oh, he had those before, I think. I never saw those. And, you know, uh, I think there's, there's certainly not, I, I don't know how much Donald Trump's sort of like teasing of an announcement or coming out now, uh, but clearly this is a strategy that he's following. And I think part of it is he wants to be he wants to be participating in this election in some way as a way of launching his uh, campaign. Um, but there you have it, folks. I mean, it it uh, hopefully. For some folks, it increases the stakes in this election because, you know, the last we heard from Dave Weigel was this interesting dynamic where it is in blue states where there is a surprising danger to Democratic candidates because they don't have the urgency in many instances of a full abortion ban that you might have in other states. Like, let's say, I don't know, a place like Michigan or a place like maybe maybe Georgia or a place like North Carolina or um, or Wisconsin, um, just to name a few. So that's the dynamic that's going on. Well, I mean, just to to put a point on that, Biden is coming to New York over the weekend to campaign in Yonkers with Kathy Hochul, which that says a lot about how the Democrats view that race. And if in New York it's that close between Lee Zeldin and he's been able to effectively use crime to 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 get ahead to uh, in the polls like this, that means it's happening when there's less of a media spotlight nationally across the country, I think. So I don't know. That's concerning. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, a couple of words of our sponsors, and then we will um, uh, be talking to Heather Parton, or as you may know her, Digby. One of our sponsors today is Kamikoto Knives. They make great Japanese steel kitchen knives. They use traditional techniques from Japan. Kamikoto builds on the legacy of over 800 years of Japanese technology and expertise, creating knives that have been meticulously handcrafted from traditional techniques dating back to the Edo period of Japan. Um, Kamikoto uses only steel that is sourced from mills in Japan. Each blade is crafted using techniques, like I said, that have been honed and perfected by generations of knifesmiths. Each Kamikoto knife goes through a rigorous 19-step process that takes several years from start to finish to complete. Each knife is individually inspected with a lifetime guarantee. Check this out. um, They come in a very... uh, in a beautiful, Whoa. heavy uh, ash box like this, ash being a type of wood, um, which I know fairly well. Uh, these knives are really, um, they're beautiful. They're well, well weighted, single uh, edge uh, bevel. So they get super, super sharp. Um, and th- they have all different types of knives. You go over there, different sizes. Um, and, uh, I need to have you chopping something. I think next time. Next time I will be I will be doing that. But they, um, uh, because of their single bevel edge, Kamikoto knives can achieve an unbelievably sharp edge that you can't get with other knives. 
They can cut through your ribeye like butter. You can maintain the edge of your blades with one of Kamakoto's sharpening whetstones. Kamakoto knives are used by several chefs working at Michelin star restaurants. They um, are now running a Black Friday sale, I guess in anticipation of Black Friday, offering Majority Report uh, viewers and listeners an extra $50 off any purchase with the discount code MAJORITY on top of their other special offers. You can go uh, to kamikoto.com slash majority. That's K-A-M-I-K-O-T-O dot com slash majority to get your knives set and help support our channel. And I would imagine they also make beautiful gifts for somebody, mm. you know, if you got somebody who takes their cooking pretty seriously, uh, there you go. I could use those. Great gift. Do you, are you... I like to cook, yeah, and I my knives are pretty dull. I was actually thinking about that, so I'm going to look into it. Uh, another one of our sponsors today, Hold On Bags. This is great, and particularly if, well, I mean, for a wide range of reasons. Uh, but for me, because of the cats, you got to take out uh, the, the cat poop all the time. And out of the house in the right. cat litter thing. And I feel bad. I don't want to use plastic bags every time because you're creating all sorts of mess. Well, here's the answer. You got a hundred billion plastic bags that are used and thrown away every year. And here is a better way. Hold on is a company that's born from the idea that there must be a better way to go about our daily chores. Trash bags and kitchen bags are necessary staples. Of course, how else am I going to get that cat poop and cat litter out of the house? I get two cats. One's diabetic. The amount of pee that comes out of that cat, you can't believe. Do they have to be 100% plastic? No. Hold on trash and kitchen bags are heavy duty, plant-based, non-toxic, 100% home compost compostable, which means they break down in weeks, not decades, without filling up our landfills or polluting our oceans. Their zip seal kitchen bags come in sandwich or gallon sized bags. To fill all of your needs from holding carrots to crayons or, you know, the cat stuff. Uh, Hold On wants to be part of the growing movement away from single plastic, uh, which if you ask most experts is the single worst kind of plastic. I've switched all my kids like uh, lunch stuff into like containers that we do every now and then. You may need a plastic bag. This is a great way to do it. Uh, at every stage, production, disposal, and decomposition, plastic bags are doing harm to our earth or our water, even our bodies. Do you know, like, the plastics, like, something like 40% of the plastics that are in our, uh, have, have been, have been uh, created in the past, like, 18 to 20 years? Oh. It's just, it, it, it's just, it, it's moving incredibly rapidly. Uh, hold on bags are on a mission to make daily chores something you can feel good about one bag at a time. To shop plant-based bags and replace single-use plastics all over your home, visit holdonbags, one word, dot com slash majority or enter majority at checkout to save 20% off your order. Sustainability has never been more simple. That's holdonbags, H-O-L-D-O-N-B-A-G-S, one word, dot com slash majority or enter majority to receive 20% off your order. Small things can lead to lasting change if we stop and say, hold on. And lastly, uh, if you run a business, you can supercharge your knowledge, your sales, and your success with Shopify. It is the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources that were once reserved for big business doesn't matter if you're an upstart, a startup, the, an established business alike. All of this stuff is scalable, as they say, uh, but also super easy to set up. You can sell everywhere. Doesn't matter online, offline, and synchronize um, all of these like online or in-person sales. And you can stay informed, get a sense of what in your inventory is selling the best, is my understanding. Um Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. One of those businesses, the Majority Report Merch Shop. Mm -hmm. Check it out. Every time you buy on there, you're using Shopify. Why? Because it's easy even for, uh, you know, marginally uh, capable people like myself. 
Um, you can reach customers online across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps. Facebook, Inst Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, uh, all more. Plus, gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. It is more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is possibility, and it is powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash majority, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash majority right now. That's S S H O P. I F Y dot com slash majority. Uh, do it now. You get 14 days free. As always, links will be in the YouTube and podcast descriptions. Um, and just a reminder, it's your support that keeps this show uh, thriving and surviving. Um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Heather Parton, or as you may know her, Digby. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, folks, it is uh, Friday, and uh, what better day to play this song? Are you ready for some PP? Like uh, I, I, we could put this on the, a loop, and this would be nice, like dinner music. <laughs> oh, it's uh, it is. lovely! <laughs> it is. I really have to play that my next dinner party for sure. There you go. Just, <laughs> on, okay, just have it go on. Maybe we can just strip out, you know, have an instrumental for like a half an hour, and then nice. come back yeah. in and out. Heather Parton, columnist at Salon.com, of course, proprietor of the Uber blog, uh, Hullabaloo. Um, Welcome. We are four days out. I don't know how many times you and I have had a conversation on the eve of a of a midterm or another election. Um, and you wrote a piece this morning, actually, that was which I've been sort of saying for for a while. And uh, I had just finished having a conversation with Bradley about this, which is like, it is so hard to parse what's happening with these polls for people like for, for, for lay people. I mean, I, but even it, it just feels like there's so many polls. It is hard to make an assessment of each of these polls. Um, it's also hard to know how well pollsters have captured what's going on because it is such a weird time. Um, give me your thoughts on it. 
Well, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, that's that's when you know you're if you're following this closely as we are, and I'm sure a lot of people are. This is a very important election, and we're all kind of on pins and needles waiting to see what happens here. Um, the polling is just you know it's just it's just odd. You know, when in, in my piece I wrote, you know, if you'd have told me a year ago that the Democrats would be that it would be within the margin of error um, in the polling aggregates that perhaps the, the you know, they could go either way. I would have said you were crazy because you remember after the 2021 off year elections, the conventional wisdom was, was that the Republicans were just they were going to sweep. It was going to be a huge red wave, maybe a red tsunami, maybe unprecedented, you know, it, Biden's poll numbers were in the dirt and you had inflation soaring sky high and gas prices and all that. And then you had that, you know, months and months of the Sturm and Drong that was going on in the Senate with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. And it looked like Biden's agenda was dead in the water. All of that sort of added up to a, con a CW, a conventional wisdom that it was it was done. It was just a done deal. And, you know, you pile on top of that the historical sort of, you know, mandate that says that the off year, you know, the, the, the party in the White House always loses seats. And, and, you know, it didn't seem unreasonable to me to think that was going to happen. I kind of assumed it. And I think most people did. And then obviously the, the Supreme Court, like, you know, overturned Roe versus Wade and things seemed over the summer to really be shifting the other direction. And where we've ended up now is this polling within the margin of error. And the margin of error is something to real. It, it's particularly, you know, important to think about during these midterms. Midterms are kind of hard to to poll. I mean, you poll this generic ballot, which is, would you rather have Democrats or Republicans in power? And you know, that sort of gives a sense of where people are, which at this point would be tied. If you look at the poll, if you look at the the aggregate polling, it appears to be tied. And then each individual race has its own dynamics and. And then you have this new, you know, problem that has been growing for some time, and it's now seems to have reached sort of a critical mass over the last couple of cycles, that the polls are just off. And the problem is, is that it's in the last two cycles, it's been off pretty substantially by undercounting Republicans. Now, the problem is, is that they're, they've always been off to a certain degree in midterms in particular, but they, it goes the other way too. 2012 was off by dem, uh, the undercounted Democrats. In fact, 538 had a good piece this week about saying, you know, look, <laughs> this is a close election. And if you look at it and you look at the, the historical, you know, sort of averages, uh, this could go either way. And yeah, they literally said, I mean, they literally said like, Democrats could hold on and retain both houses, or it could be, they could get completely wiped out. Right. And I mean, there's not many other options. Yeah, those are the options. <laughs> I mean, like it's it's basically like everything's on the table right yeah. now, which is a very bizarre place to be. And then I would add to that, I would add to that that the 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 the, the summary pieces, and, and we should say to the extent that's polling, like I I feel like there are people who can say, well, if you look only at the polls that look at let's say a thousand people instead of six hundred. Uh, you're going to get a much better sense of what's going on, you know, here. And that's, that, that may or may not be true. Um, and there's also been, there is also this sort of like, we're, we're back to that era where the, the conventional wisdom, as you call it, the, the sort of the beltway media types, they frame everything as on some level, like, bad for the Democrats. I mean, it used to right. be basically before, uh, you know, we had memes or we were close. It was, you know, it was, um, you know, Democrats sweep all houses. This looks bad for the Democrats. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to now they're going to be in a position where they could be held accountable for anything that happens in mm -hmm. government. You know, it's like, it's always. And so it's very hard to not, you know, I mean, I try and read, you know, five or 10 articles a day about a specific topic, but I still see all the headlines and it's hard not to get influenced by that. And it, 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 one wonders how much influence that has on the electorate as well. Well, there is that. I mean, I, you do wonder, and I think it's, it, well, it's certainly, you know, demobilizing or at least somewhat depressing for Democrats to be reading 
that, you know, it's all over, you know, you've got them, they're measuring the drapes in San Nancy Pelosi's office, you know, I mean, this is, it's pretty clear where the media stands. And you're absolutely right that it's, that it is in that every single thing that happens, a bad poll comes out for, you know, Raphael Warnock in Georgia, and it's all over, right? I mean, this is just, well, looks like the, in fact, I think Politico had a headline yesterday that said, you know, Republicans finally get off the mat. You know, what? Have they been on the mat? I don't think so. But, you know, whatever. Um, it, you know, they, they seem to be framing the, the election. Now, it's always bad for us, right? I mean, and I pointed out in my piece, you know, 2016, a lot of what happened in 2016 was a result of, of the Beltway deciding that Hillary Clinton had the election won. And they had no obligation to sort of observe any kind of, you know, uh, you know, to be careful in any way about the way that they were presenting that election. And of course, it became, you know, they were shown that that wasn't true. That was also a very close election. And the media was irresponsible in their coverage of Clinton and the emails and all that. Um, they don't seem to have learned anything by that. And it is even more dangerous now what they're doing. Because as we all know, what we have set up here, what is absolutely being planned, they've got lawyers in place, is that if Republicans lose this election, or even if they don't gain as many seats as they think they deserve here, which apparently is all of them, um, they're going to contest the election. They're going to say that it was stolen. They are prepared to do this. And by setting up this idea that Republicans can't lose this election with these, with the coverage that they're doing, they are just asking for this to happen. The, if there's ever been an election where the media should be very careful about how they're framing it, they, it should have been this one. I'm not saying they needed to say that, you know, that Republicans can't win or that Democrats are ahead or they don't have, just have to tell it straight down the line don't color it in any way, just be and be very clear that this is a very close election and anything could happen because that's the truth. And yet you're not seeing that. And I just I really worry now. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got violence in the air. We just saw, you know, an assault on the husband of the Speaker of the House. And this is this is not the time for them to be, you know, sort of doing their usual winking and nodding about how well we know it's really happening, don't we? Which is what, what's really going on. So I'm very concerned about that. It's 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 not impossible. You know, I, I obviously, you know, I hope the Democrats do well, at least hold the Senate. <clears throat> and it's certainly within the realm of possibility that they will. But I am worried about what the Republicans are going to do if that happens. And I, pl I put some of the blame on that on onto the media for not being really clear that it's within the realm of possibility. And they'll say that they have said it, but you and I, it's what we've just both been saying. You know, the hinting around the sort of attitude that they take, the framing of the questions, the framing of the headlines, all will lead, is leading Republicans to believe that they have it in the bag and they don't. So, you know, uh, they win either way, I guess, in this situation. Uh, part, yeah. Just part of it for me is that the Democrats are not as good at making the media say what they want them to say, as opposed to the Republicans who've always been really good at getting out ahead of a certain narrative and then making that a talking point in and of itself. Like the Democrats are now coming late to the, uh, oh, this is an existential threat to democracy and that's why you need to vote. And, oh, getting out ahead of like the economic uh, mm -hmm. talking points that the Republicans have been pushing. And it, it's just like, they're so much louder and more effective at getting the media to to, regurgitate what they want and democrats have never been good at that i mean that's kind of part of the issue for me it's a huge issue and it's been i mean this goes back you know decades to the whole you know and they they planned this you know the republicans this didn't happen spontaneously it happened because the republicans back in the 70s during the nixon era and just afterwards decided that they needed to uh tame the the media and they coined the phrase the liberal media back then. And they started what we always called over all these years of working the refs, right? Which is what they pound the media for being biased, which, you know, they aren't. If anything, they're the opposite now. But what they've done is pounded in to the media's mind this idea that they have to go out of their way to be fair to Republicans because Republicans are under, you know, because they're, they're the media elite, the coastal elites whatever and they're, they're out of touch with the salt of the earth real americans out there and so they have to go out of their way to do this and so republicans have pounded that into the into the media's mind and they're now they just reflexively sort of respond to it complaints 
from for me, even with, you know, the right wing has its very own media that's, ex I would say, equally powerful now to the mainstream media that, you know, half the country watches and listens to them exclusively. And the Democrats have never really found a way to do that. They keep they want to have this idea that the media is neutral and that this is the reality based, you know, uh, media that isn't, you know, isn't uh, subject to democratic influence. Um, it's not working. You're absolutely right. It doesn't work. I mean, the asymmetry in the way that the media reacts to both parties and the way both parties deal with the media is, uh, you know, is very, very obvious. And it, it's, it's hurt the Democrats a lot. And, you know, I honestly don't know what they're going to do to try and to try and change that. I mean, it seems to me as though, you know, this is really, a, you know, it, the problem's gotten worse over the years rather than better. Uh, I, I remember, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember who, who it was, that uh, very early on when we started to do uh, Air America, we had a guy on, maybe his name was Massey, I think. I, I want to say he was from the Columbia Journalism Review, but I, cannot, I, can't, I can't remember. And um, this dynamic of, at that time, it was letter writing, right, where uh, the right could organize these letter writing campaigns and pressure uh, journalists. And, you know, a lot of these journalists, particularly, you know, in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, they're, they're you know, coastal elites, they are very self-conscious of being seen, you know, and these are not leftists, but they're, they're liberal, you know, standard liberal uh, types. They are very self-conscious of, of the fact that they, in their personal lives, are this way. And they they must not let that show. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of o uh, overcompensation yeah. uh, uh, for that. And, and and it really comes out in these instances. Like, I mean, we talked about this mm -hmm. during the Trump years where it's like they're finally coming around and being able to sort of like, you know, not be so timid in criticizing a Republican president. And I think you and I both knew it was going to revert. Now, that's not to let the Democrats off the hook, no, no, but no. it is to simply say, like, they're not up to necessarily the challenge, which is definitely greater for them than it is uh, for Republicans in influencing where the media is at. Let's talk a little bit about um, about how the the Democrats have done. It's been interesting because the 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 story that I think is is out there now is that by the end of august any electoral energy that the democrats were going to get because of abortion mm -hmm. had already been sort of like solidified there, it was not going to grow in some respect and you know i mentioned this at the top of the show dave weigel said like you know that's why you're seeing congressional races in blue states are you know sort of like abnormally favoring the republicans because there isn't that sort of jeopardy that people feel about an right. abortion ban that they might feel in a in a purple state let's say mm -hmm. and um and so there's been an absence of any type of sort of like broad uh message from the democrats you know and i think like I think the I think the to the extent that Biden's agenda was fulfilled, which is, you know, I don't know if you want to look at it in terms of just sheer numbers, maybe 15 percent or, you know, uh, relative to build back better. But the, there was the attempt on the on the student debt relief it's tied up in the courts, but it's there. People can sign up for it. And I think that helped uh, a little bit. And there was some movement on uh, on cannabis reform. It, Enough that there was less of a story of them doing nothing, let's say. Right. Um, there, there was a failure to sort of say like, okay, you get the abortion uh, ban that, that could be coming. There's not going to be a federal abortion ban until Joe Biden's not president, let's say. But the Social Security thing was the first thing that, and they were late to the game on this, it seems mm -hmm. to me. When it became clear that the strategy was going to be Republicans are going to leverage the debt ceiling to get mm -hmm. cuts in Social Security. And you and I, and you in particular, 
on day one of the Obama administration and, and, and whatever it was, January 20th, 2008, you were like, people have got to watch out. This guy's been talking about so-called entitlement reform. We watched Joe Biden uh, basically, you know, do an end run around Harry Reid and put it on the table. Uh, fortunately, Mark Meadows and those lunatics were just too, they couldn't say yes. And Mitch McConnell wanted to sink Obama. But they started to use that late. And then just the other day, we're watching this from Joe Biden, which is really frustrating because this should have been a message much earlier, particularly when the Fed is starting to basically articulate we're out to crash the economy because of so-called inflation, um, which is not to diminish the fact that people aren't paying higher prices for things. But inflation also comes with it in our parlance an entire backstory about what is causing it and then what we need to do to remedy it. And Biden rolls out a slightly different story about inflation, which is corporate greed. Mm -hmm. Here it is. But rather than increasing our investments in America or giving American consumers a break, their excess profits are going back to their shareholders and they're buying back their stocks. So the executive pays are going to skyrocket. All right. Pause it for one second. He's, I mean, he's talking about oil companies specifically here. But this, we're seeing this across the board mm -hmm. with corporate uh, profits yep. in many sectors are going through the roof. And if the story that we're being told about inflation is that, and the, 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 the chairman of the Fed just said the other day, like, we, we need to create more unemployment. We need to soften the labor market. If it was about wages, um, you wouldn't see these huge corporate profits, right? Because supposedly the price increases would be eaten up, eaten up. But he's also talking about like, you know, rail companies. He's talking about food companies uh, and oil companies. Take it back from the beginning. Sorry. But rather than increasing our investments in America or giving American consumers a break, their excess profits are going back to their shareholders and they're buying back their stocks. So the executive pays are going to skyrocket. Give me a break. Enough is enough. Look, I'm a capitalist. You've heard me say this before. I have no problem with corporations turning a fair profit or getting a return on their investment in innovation. But this is remotely what's happening. Oil companies, record profits today, are not because they're doing something new or innovative. Their profits are a windfall of war. The windfall from the brutal conflict that's ravaging Ukraine and hurting tens of millions of people around the globe. You know, at a time of war, any company receiving historic windfall profits like this has a responsibility to act beyond their narrow self-interest of its executives and shareholders. I think they have a responsibility to act in the interest of their consumers, their community, and their country. To invest in America by increasing production and refining capacity, because they've ha they don't want to do that. They, they have the opportunity to do that. Lowering prices for consumers to the pump. You know, if they don't, they're going to pay a higher tax on their excess profits and face other re restrictions. My team will. All right. So he's basically there uh, more or less announcing, you know, the potential for a windfall tax unless um, unless these oil companies cut into their profits. But this is the narrative that should have been from, frankly, you know, four months ago. And I mentioned that, you know, I, I covered the Warnock uh, Walker debate. Warnock brought it up like twice he said the words corporate profits and you know maybe gouging but they ne they didn't like mm. hammer this because because I, mean, I i don't know why i was just going to ask you <laughs> why you think that is because this one seems like a gimme i don't i don't really get it i who who what constituents of the democrats are going to be upset by this message. How, how does that, you know, I, I, that's it. I mean, you know, that's the only <laughs> thing that could be, but he, he, even that, you know, at this point, it seems to me like, you know, that this is, it's kind of existential here, you know, donors are uh, the least of their problems. If we end up having the debt ceiling uh, held hostage and the whole world economy crashes. I mean, this, that seems like a crazy trade-off to me. Um, and I, I'm 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 a little bit stymied by that. I mean that I and yeah, I think we talked about this. Maybe maybe I just thought we did, but um, I think we talked about this at some point. The idea that that you know relying so heavily on the abortion message, which obviously had to be front and center and made perfect sense, but the idea of relying so heavily on it was was seemed a little odd to me, simply because 
you know, we're in the, this post pandemic period, you know, to the extent it is post pandemic, but you know, the, the, the post pandemic period here, you know, everything's in chaos still, you know, there's still this sense of just total dislocation and, and, and the, the, nothing's returned to normal. I mean, everything still feels very, very much in turmoil. And you have to address that. You have to you have to address that, and you have to do it in in a sort of a systemic way. It seems to me you've got to give people. First of all, you have to acknowledge that it's happening, and and say you know we get it. This you know we feel the same way. And then you have to sort of say look you know sort of chop it up and and say you know these are the things that are that are going on, and here's how how that's all related. Because to me the 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 global sort of issue that issue of the you know turmoil stemmed from two things the pandemic and the the Donald Trump administration and the era that we had just come through and and the 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 ongoing assault on democracy that sort of was a was a consequence of that those two things you know are easily sort of put together into a narrative that just sort of never really gelled if they even tried and now you have republicans coming back in playing i mean it's astonishing that they're coming that they are planning to come back in with the exactly the same playbook that they had when they when they left <laughs> which is you know i mean we're going to cut taxes we're going to cut social security and medicare and we're you know i mean i haven't heard them saying that they're going to you know overturn obamacare but i think that's going to be part of entitlement reform now i think they're just mm. going to put that they'll try and roll back uh, the medicaid i would absolutely imagine in some fashion and, or another. and probably the subsidies as well i have i have no reason to believe otherwise so you know you're absolutely right i mean these are things that were just sort of hanging out there it seemed like low-hanging fruit with the windfalls profit the social security which was in rick scott's plan and he came out with that last spring i think yeah but yeah, the, and this is this goes back it. to my critique about them not getting ahead of narratives and well, pushing things is that they're constantly playing prevent defense and then they're like oh wait we we, we have to push the ball down the field at the uh, you know because right, the, they right. actually could come back and win this thing i, I right. mean i and i learn. think this is right. I, I think this yeah. is i mean uh, you know emma said uh, donors and i i am of the mind that Democrats could go out in this environment and say, we're going to put, we're, you know, we're going to put corporations on trial, uh, you know, a, a, and they would still be able to communicate to these corporations. Like, not really. I mean, like, I mean, like I, I'm fairly cynical about the democratic party, but with that said, um, we need a majority in the Senate because yeah. we need to get those judges on there. And Biden's done a fairly good job with the judges. We need uh, the executive branch to be focused on things like, you know, uh, the the uh, on on labor issues, on antitrust issues, rather than all hands on deck to deal with the um, the twenty four seven Hunter Biden, uh, you know, trials that are uh, show trials that are happening in the House. Um, and I I think it is, if not the donors directly. I think it's it really is the consultant class that deals with Democratic candidates because mm. they have an even greater investment in keeping corporate uh, corporations happy because they they when when they're not working for Democrats on these elections they're or and, and simultaneously their client roster are these people and the idea that people are just touching on it like this is I mean put aside the fact that like. You know, at one point, Biden should have said, like, maybe Powell isn't that right guy to be mm. sitting uh, at, at the top of the Fed. But the idea that you can you're going to deal with inflation, and this is not to say that it isn't real. Uh, but the problem is we don't have a word for price increases that are not a function of overheated demand. Right. In the, we don't have a word for that. It's just inflation includes that as well as, you know. Uh, a hurricane hits and uh, things cost more because there's less of it because the sh you know the the trucks can't get across the bridge that washed away, and 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 there you need to address it. You have a you have a a great story that also happens to be true. There's no reason why in this environment uh, the corporate profits should be this high. Somebody uh, on the IM you know uh, reminded us that. Nixon instituted price controls. He mm -hmm. instituted wage controls too, which, you know, if you can get lock both those in right at this moment, but I, I'm down with that short term mm -hmm. because 
I, you know, what they're looking to do now is drive wages back down. Right. And, th- and, and that's all the Fed is doing. And there's no reason to believe that until you immiserate, like literally immiserate millions of people that these corporations are going to drop their prices, they're making record profits. You got to go directly at that, it seems to me, just as a, even of the most cynical political, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, perspective and they won't do it. And I'm convinced it's because they have a consultant class that is like, uh, try this, try that, try this. And we know that they were confused as to what they're doing because of the way that they're like in the last minute, you know, trying to grab the steering wheel again and saying like, we, we gotta, we gotta try this because they see that the, the Democrats are either either headed towards an iceberg or, are in a position to sort of like maybe actually win. And uh, it is incredibly frustrating. Um, One guy who seems to be doing pretty good at this, I don't know if he's going to win his race in Ohio, um, is uh, Tim Ryan. You know, you and I have not necessarily a fan of Tim Ryan, although like at one point I was like, maybe he'd be a better speaker of the house only insofar from a progressive perspective, only because He's not associated with progressives and there is no sort of like people, progressives could run harder at him than they could at Pelosi in terms of trying to uh, Mm -hmm. push the the caucus. But he is like taking a, uh, he's, his campaign has been marked by two things. One, taking a page out of Sherrod uh, Brown's Mm -hmm. uh, uh, playbook, which is to be sort of like labor focused and then the other, he does a pretty good job here of, you know, sort of like pushing the um, democracy at stake. But the, I am less, in general, I am less enthusiastic about democracy is at stake talking point because it's, I think it's really hard to get people who are not already inclined to sort of see that, to see that. In this current environment. And I should say, though, I mean, while this he, he the, when it comes to this question, he didn't get, get a good response from the Fox audience in this town hall. He spoke about corporate price gouging and got cheers. Well, at the end of this, he actually does. Oh, so he, watch uh, the, how he turns this around. It's interesting. They stormed the Capitol on January 6th. They beat up 140 police officers, killed, killed one. Okay, they killed what they killed one. All right, can we pause it here for a second? Can we pause it here for a second? They're booing because the uh, the cop who died died 24 hours later. The proximate uh, cause was uh, a heart attack, but the guy was having seizures throughout that like whole day because he had been sprayed with with stuff and had been like you know brutalized. So to say that, like, they're not related because they're 24 hours apart is basically like saying, like, I got hit by a car and then I went into, you know, I went to the, you know, a hospital. I went home and, you know, a blood clot killed me. Well, OK, but the car, I mean, honestly, no, like, it's like someone stabbing somebody and then they bleed out and die six hours later. And it's saying, well, it's the hospital that killed. Them. Or No, it's like saying it's no, he died from loss of blood. Yeah. I mean, the the. The, this goes to show you the level, the successfulness of the propaganda out of the like, Fox News. But wind it back because he brings it back around in a way that like he reframes it or it doesn't really reframe. It doesn't walk away from that. But he, he, he reframes it. And um, this this strategy is a good one because this is about there's two ends of the spectrum, right? How do you bring out your own voters and I feel like we've we've topped out on the democracy talk with with Democratic voters. But can you suppress Republican voters? Let make them less enthusiastic. And I think this does a pretty good job of that. They stormed the Capitol on January 6th. They beat up 140 police officers, killed killed one. OK, they killed what they killed one. <laughs> We all, 
we all we all watched we all watched the we all watched the video. We all watched the video. And I work. Let him finish, please. And I work. I'm, I'm happy to have this conversation. I'm not afraid to have this conversation. These are the conversations we need to have in this country. I welcome you guys. Let's just be respectful. But I'm not afraid to stand here and defend my position. Um, on January 6th, 140, cap, I, I sit on the subcommittee that funds the Capitol Police. These are my friends. 140 of them got hurt. And some of them still can't go back to work because they were beat up with lead pipes, they were sprayed with pepper spray, they were beaten with flagpoles, okay? They were trying to overthrow the government. They were trying to stop the peaceful transition of the government. What else were they doing there? They're gonna kill Mike Pence, right? They want to kill Nancy Pelosi. Now somebody's beating up Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. J.D. Vance raised money for the insurrectionists. He made several social media posts to raise money for them. Now, again, I don't care what your politics are, but Americans should say no. We have to say no to that. We're going to try to get as many questions as we I mean, in the end, the guy manages to get an applause for that. And, I, you know, again, my point is, yeah. like, I think voters who are going to come out and vote for Tim Ryan, I don't know, they, they, they either got that message by this point or they haven't. But there's still time... You know, that message, I think, is better deployed on Republicans who are going out to, uh, to vote. You know, I mean, I've seen some uh, some uh, you know reports that um, Republican women, you know, we know about the surge in, in Democratic uh, uh, women registrations. And you can see in some of the early voting data that a lot of them are women. And there's a higher level of Democratic early voting uh, uh, women who have early voted than in past elections to the extent that this is in any way, you know, sort of predictive, who knows, but there's also less Republican women who have come out to early vote than in the past couple of elections. Again, maybe that's predictive. Maybe it's not, maybe it's indicative of, of the abortion bans. Maybe it's not, but it seems to me that the democracy stuff could be deployed to make some Republicans less enthusiastic. In the meantime, the way that you get more Democrats out is to talk about like, these guys are like, they're announcing their plan to cut Social Security and Medicare, right. and they're, they, they can do this even with Joe Biden in presidency uh, with the debt ceiling. Well, that's key, I think, is to be specific about that, is to say, look, you know, yes, we have President Biden there, but, you know, remember that uh, over the past 25 years, they've shut down the government numerous times. They've held the debt ceiling hostage. The the global economy is teetering at the moment, just generally speaking, as we try to recover from this pandemic. One, and another point that inflation is up all over the world. It isn't just Joe Biden's policies that have created this problem. And you've got these people coming in, these, you know, these yahoos who, who, you know, stormed the Capitol and, you know, and who, you know, are, are voting for people who are enthusiastic about them. They're coming up and they're they're saying outright that they're going to hold the debt ceiling hostage unless Joe Biden um, cuts Social Security and Medicare. That's what they're planning to do. That's what they're saying they're going to do. And you can specifically bring up people like, you know, Kevin McCarthy. I mean, the head of the what's his name? Uh, you know, Jim Jordan Rick and, Scott. and Rick Scott. This is in their plans. This isn't just some vague thing we're hearing on the street. I mean, they're out there saying this and they have to be specific about it. Well, they have to be. It's well, we're at the end now. But, it, you know, this was the message that needed to be. And, and it's, uh, again, it all ties in, right? These are people who are anti-democratic, authoritarian, you know, far-right ideologues who, who want to come into office. And they're, they're going to, you know, if you care about the democracy argument, there is one to be made. You know, Joe Schmo over here is running for secretary of state, and he wants to, you know, to basically to, to make sure that Democrats can never win elections again. And that's going to be his job. You know, specifically, sort of, sort of point to to how this is being played out, how they're using these things to affect, you know, your life, right? I mean, you know, all that's a cliche. You know, you have to talk about people's lives and what what it impacts them, but it can't be in the abstract. You know, there has to be they, they, it has to be specific when you talk about this. Now, 
I don't know how much this is being discussed on the trail. I mean, you hear Tim Ryan there talking about it. That was very effective because he's brought up J.D. Vance specifically. Yep. And so he's supporting these freaks, right? You know, he, he isn't just giving lip service. He actually is, you know, running fundraisers for these people. Doesn't that make you uncomfortable, you know, Republican suburban ladies? Or does, you know, do you feel good about that? I mean, are you okay with that? I mean, that's the kind of thing that I don't know is happening in the, in the, you know, various districts and in the house districts or on the trail, but I hope it is because that really is the truth. That's, that's what's, what's been at stake. And, you know, none of the boilerplate that people have used in the past about social security and Medicare has the same resonance that this current situation does because we know what they're capable of, right? We know, you know, you, the Democrats have been, you know, look, Republicans have been trying to cut Social Security for, what, 60, 70 years now. 90. 90 years. Okay. For uh, 85. A century. Yeah, whatever. Almost a century. They've been trying to cut. So they've been trying to get rid of Social Security and they've never stopped and they're still doing it. Okay. Uh, you know, we've heard it all before, right? The Democrats always say it. It's always okay. Things are different now. And I think people know things are different now because the Republican Party is batshit crazy. And they will do things that are batshit crazy. We saw it happen on January 6th. We saw it when they when they voted for Donald Trump, you know, crazy man for for president. And we saw what happened over the course of five years where we barely escaped without a major catastrophe. And arguably, we didn't with the pandemic and his reaction response to it and the massive numbers of deaths that probably didn't have to happen if if he hadn't have taken the attack that he took. So, you know, this, this, is, this is much more salient now, I think. These arguments are much more salient now. And we're going to see this played out. If the Republicans do win, and again, you know, I'm not ready to throw in the towel because I honestly don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm really agnostic. And I try not to be optimistic about elections ever because it just, you know, it kills me. I wind up, you know, it's taken to my bed for a week when this stuff goes wrong, the wrong way. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I, I tend to be pessimistic, but I'm honestly really just agnostic now. I, I don't know what's going on. I can't, it's very hard for me. I mean, all, all of us here and most of the people who are watching now, I'm sure are paying very close attention and what we're seeing is just mush. So, you know, we have to take a deep breath, get through the weekend, get through next Tuesday. And by the way, probably a while afterwards, everybody needs to gird themselves. You remember in 2018, Sam, I was on with you on election night and, and everyone was in despair because it looked like Republican Democrats had not really pulled off much of a win. I mean, right. if they did, it was just kind of eking it out. And we were going, geez, you know, and, and talk about depressing because, you know, Donald Trump was in full effect. And of course, it turned out with the late counting, you know, over time that it really was. Particularly in California, we should say, yeah, because there's a the, big the, substantial win. California is not only three hours later, they also, it takes a, it takes a long time. Month. And, it, yeah, it's ridiculous. and then all of a sudden, like over the next couple of days, right. you start to see this cascade of, of right. races, particularly in California. And, and California Republican Party basically went extinct it, it, it uh, in that 2018 <laughs> election. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I, I would I would encourage people to to get out over the weekend and you know knock on some doors, make some phone calls, Absolutely. and this and that. One last thing, you wrote a piece uh, this week about um, how Liz, the way that the Republicans disciplined Liz Cheney, and again, just the standard caveat. Um, I think Liz Cheney. Good for her, her work on the January 6th commission and impeachment, whatnot. Um, I think she probably has another lifetime or two to go before uh, there's any form of redemption uh, in my mind. And that is not even considering her who her father was. Uh, right. Like, I, you know, I'm not going to uh, sins of the father type of situation. But, you know, this is someone who as recently as. 20, you know, late 2019 was talking about Democrats actively pursuing the killing of born babies right. uh, as a policy, right? I mean, she's going up and, and making this announcement in front of the podium. I mean, so let's not, but with that said, the, 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 the punishment that she got from the Republicans, the discipline has done its job in terms of like getting all the other supposed reasonable Republicans right. And, and 
and this is the thing that like it it, it feels like one of the worst things about American politics is the failure of both the public, the media, and the politicians to understand that you can have individual politicians and they all come with something. But at the end of the day, the determining factor about these people are the coalitions who they represent right. and their voters. And it may have been the case that like 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, voters could swing either way because it wasn't that difference. You know, there, there wasn't as much polarization. And and so like a unique politician, politicians could be unique and you could have mavericks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't exist anymore in terms of like, you know, like how politicians ultimately respond. These these elections have been nationalized. I don't care if you're Larry Hogan or, you know, or, you know even maybe, like, you know, Charlie Baker. Like, if you need your Republican voters, you're going to toe the line. Yep. And I watched, you know, Joe Biden and, and watched the Biden administration go from, like, extreme ultra MAGA. And they keep doing all these machinations. And fine, you want to deploy the word MAGA? That's great. But it should always be MAGA Republicans. Because right. that tie needs to be there so that people understand I can vote for my, you know, he seems relatively nice. This, this guy I'm voting for in Rhode Island or New Hampshire or wherever it is, but understand when you vote for him, you're empowering Jim Jordan. That's basically it. Like whatever you think yeah. the worst impulse of the Republican party that the, the, the Democrats still don't seem to sort of like get that yet. Well, they're, they're, they're running scared as usual, fighting the last war terrified because Hillary Clinton was hit so hard for saying that there was a basket of deplorables in the Republican Party. And, you know, to going back to Emma's point earlier, um, once again, you know, you had the re Hillary Clinton said a perfectly reasonable thing. And it was true. There was a basket of deplorables in the Republican Party. There is even a bigger basket now. Um, and but the Republicans took that and they started, you know, wearing hats that said proud, deplorable and oh, we're deplorable. And oh, this is so awful. Yeah. How dare you say that about me? I'm deplorable. And the Democrats, instead of just going, well, yeah, you are. Yes, you're re deplorable. You walk with deplorables. You know, it's like saying there's good people on both sides. Right. You know, no, there aren't. Um, there are bad people and you are associating with them and you are not disavowing them and you're not you know, in any way condemning their behavior. So, you know, basically you're endorsing it. We put, Democrats don't want to make that argument because it makes them uncomfortable because everyone says, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're putting down their voters and that's not right. Well, guess what? I don't know if anybody's noticed, but the Republicans have no problem putting down the Democratic voters. I don't know if you've noticed, but, you know, look, th this is how they play the game. And you know, I'm not saying, oh, tit for tat and you got to do this. But you're absolutely right that if they don't say it out loud, if they are not willing to confront this thing and say to John, to Chris Sununu up in New Hampshire or Larry Hogan in Maryland, Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, all these people who are running around the country going, oh, well, we're different. You know, we're independent. We're, we're not really Trumpers. And, you know, we don't think the election was stolen. And they're out there campaigning for people who do. And they're putting their imprimatur on those people and saying, well, you know, look, it's more important that, you know, they care about marginal tax rates than it is that they are refusing to acknowledge the, you know, the, the, the election in 2020, that they are calling the president illegitimate, that they are basically endorsing an insurrection, uh, uh, you know, a, a violent mob that threatened to kill Mike Pence. I mean, Mike Pence is down there. I mean, he's, he's, he's actually campaigning with some of these people. Who, you know, who have been, I mean, they, they, they wanted to kill him. And the Democrats are afraid to sort of call that out and say, you know, look, the reasonable people are right in there with the unreasonable people. That's the Republican Party. And what you say is so is so perfect because it's so easy. MAGA Republicans, not ultra MAGAs or MAGAs, MAGA this, MAGA this. It's MAGA Republicans. If that's what you want, if that's how you want to put it, I mean, I would, you know, maybe fascist Republicans would work for me, but you know, maybe that's too, you know, too florid uh, a description. But you know, MAGA Republicans, you have to you have to tie that to the party because that's the truth. 
There is I mean, no reasonable Republican Party that doesn't exist. It just and doesn't. You, and, the, and the thing is, if you say MAGA Republicans, if you think there are Republicans out there who are going to be open to your message, they can tell themselves they're not MAGA Republicans. Right. I'm not one of them. And not it me. also gives you the opportunity down the road to, to sort of meld these things. I mean, I watched the conservatives, uh, you know, in the Republican Party do this uh, to, you know, the, the center center left. Uh, for years and years. And and I mean, this is the way that this is the way that corporations change. I mean, do you remember Exxon SO? Well, that's what it used to be. Like, you know, I don't know. People are most of the people who listen to the show are, are, are too young to remember or to know. But Exxon used to be called SO. And I remember, you know, like when I was a kid, I was on Dudley's SO was our uh, minor <laughs> league baseball team. And then they went to Exxon. And for like a year or two, it was S on, you know, Exxon SO or SO Exxon. And then they Facebook just dropped the just SO. Yeah. Facebook yeah. just did it. They're calling themselves meta now. You know, it's like, uh, within a few years, that'll be, you know, we'll all be just accepting that like it's normal. If it, it still exists in a few years. I mean, who knows? Well, um, Heather, uh, good luck uh, yeah. <laughs> over the next couple of days uh, trying yeah. to maintain uh, maybe we'll, uh, connect, uh, if you're around Tuesday night, we should do that. Yeah, sure. Have you come sure. on, give us the update on just, you know, uh, spend well, a little time and, uh, yeah. we'll spread the anxiety out. Exactly. Uh, right. <laughs> all right. Good. We'll, we'll be in touch. All right. uh, well, fingers as, crossed. Yeah. as always a pleasure. We will link to your stuff, obviously at salon.com oh, thank you. and thank you. the Uber blog hullabaloo. Thank uh, you so Parton. much. Thanks yeah. so much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to head into the uh, fun half of the program. Just a reminder, it is your support that uh, keeps this show alive and thriving. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can help the show survive and thrive by becoming a member today. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free show free of commercials, you get the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. You can order the Majority Report blend. Um, go uh, check out our sponsors today. Kamikoto, um, Sunset Lake Sebade, and uh, who? what was the last one we had today? Uh, hold Up Bags. And, and Hold Up Bags. Oh, yeah. Check those out. And what was the other one? And, uh, Shopify. And, and Shopify. Uh, we got links in the uh, description. Tuesday night. We're going to do a show on Tuesday. Um and just, we're going to be covering uh, the Israeli elections. The implications of this, not good. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about that on Tuesday uh, with a guest, as well as, you know, talk a little bit about the elections that are happening that night. But at that point, yeah, uh, we're kind of... folks are going to get out, got to get out. And there's not much to say about the yeah. elections on Tuesday until we get to Tuesday night. Then we're going to be b back Tuesday evening. Not sure exactly what time. We'll let you know over the next day or two. And um, we're going to do rolling coverage of two things. The elections and how uh, uh, inebriated I get. Oh, yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, for some. For, well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be there with you, I'm sure. So uh, people can check that out. And speaking of checking uh, things out, <laughs> Emma, uh, ESVN, overtime yesterday. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yesterday, uh, we actually had a lot of news given the Kyrie Irving anti-Semitism controversy. So we spoke about that in depth, uh, plus Steve Nash being scapegoated for the dysfunction there. If he is a good coach at all, we don't really know. But um, then we dove into uh, trade deadline uh, news uh, for in the NFL, as well as Bradley and I giving our picks for the weekend. This uh, guy has taken a four-game lead in our competition, which makes me uh, angry. And uh, you can witness that on our show. Yeah, yeah. He went six and zero. Last two weeks. Jesus. It's just. It's. I don't understand what's happening. Hmm. It's a little weird. It is. It. It makes me insecure. Hot hand. I mean, uh, it's like one of those things where you go play golf with the got boss. You're supposed to put a couple <laughs> into the uh, woods, is my understanding. Yeah. Uh, Maybe Matt. This week. Two things dropping today since I don't know if about you guys, but there's not a lot of podcasts that get released on sort of Saturday, Sunday. So uh, a couple things for everybody on the YouTube channel, David and I's discussion that was originally re 
a release for Patreons of Left Reckoning on Marx's German ideology, where he says uh, everybody should have the chance to, I'm going to mess up the quote, but um, be a herder and a critic and a fisherman uh, uh, to their heart's content. Um, that's a very bad uh, misreading. But um, that's going to be released on YouTube and also uh, for everybody on Sunday and then for patrons today. We had a talk with Bronwyn Meta about COP27 in Egypt and President Sisi's uh sort of um rule and uh so-called dialogue to sort of um do pr for his administ uh, regime before cop 27 and some other things that are going on with uh climate activism so check that out patreon.com slash left reckoning and we have that guy that uh, are we talking to that guy about the cop 27 did i sent you an email i think oh. back well we'll talk about that uh yeah we're going to be uh, covering that i mean that's ongoing right now and we're going to be covering that uh in the wake of uh the midterm elections yep. folks six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number i think we're going to get some phone calls today atypical for a friday see you in the fun half you are in for it all right folks six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty see you in the fun half oh, no. Oh, no. are you ready What, who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflake says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare! What a nightmare! nightmare. bring back DJ Denner. Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break time. That's fucking nonsense. See, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflakes.